Welcome to Sports World Have Your Say, your weekly chance to tell us the final score once the whistle is gone. Today, it's called a seven goal thriller, but not for Tottenham, who only scored two of them at the North London Derby. We were playing through us a little bit and, and outnumbering us in the middle of the park, and we had problems, really. Late Liverpool, the Reds need penalties to see off Cardiff in the Carling Cup final. Who writes his scripts? It's 900 not out for Ryan Giggs as he scores the winner against Norwich. I mean, obviously, um, even more so a great, great game, great day for the team. And who runs the dressing room at your club, the manager or the senior players? Who win that battle at Chelsea? And we're on Twitter. You can join the conversation at SWHYS. Loads to discuss in the next hour or so. If you've got a point to make, we've got the place to make it. So please get in touch with us here at Sports World. Have your say. All the details on the right-hand side of your screen. Loads of you already in touch via Facebook and Twitter. Give us a call using country code plus 44 20 70 83 73 33. Joining us tonight is West Brom Stephen Reid. But first, a summary of the latest news. Hello, this is Sports World. Have your say on the BBC. I'm Jason Robertson, the presenter's chair in place of Amanda. And in my old chair is my old teammate when we were both at Blackburn. I'm very pleased to welcome West Brom and Ireland's Stephen Reid. But he'll be known as Reedy from now on. Today we'll talk about a subject close to both of our hearts. Who runs the dressing room? AVB would hope it's him at Chelsea, but maybe one or two of the senior players think they should be getting a bigger say. And what happens when one of your own teammates falls out with the manager and goes AWOL, then comes back and says sorry? Would you forgive Carlos Tevez? But first, let's start with some of the games played today. That dramatic Carling Cup final when Cardiff equalised against Liverpool in the dying minutes of extra time to take the game to penalties, before losing after two of theirs hit the woodwork. Reedy, were you like, were you like me feeling for them players? Oh, absolutely amazing stuff. Just catching, our, just catching our breath back now. You've got to feel for Cardiff. Gave everything, courage, determination, grit. And at the end there, I think we're rooting for Cardiff to take it. Um, the underdogs going into it, you've got a feel for them. Really, we've both taken penalties. What's your psychology going into them? I think in a, in a situation like that at Wembley, full house, I think a lot of the psychology of it goes out the window. Um, I think it's about whoever fancies the penalty there and then. Obviously, substitutions were made. Um, but yeah, once again, you've got a feel for them. Without a doubt, I think, you know, Liverpool a little bit because of their Premier League side, because Cardiff are the underdogs, do you think they went into that thinking that, you know, we better make sure we, we win this and make sure we score those penalties, whereas Cardiff are thinking, well, we've done great just to get here? Well, I, for one, I, I favoured Cardiff going into that. They nicked the goal last minute of, of extra time. Um, in a way, I think that took the pressure off them. I fancied them to go on and win the game in penalties. Uh, wasn't to be. Maybe a little bit more experience of the big games in the Liverpool dressing room gave them that edge. Were you surprised that um, Cardiff took Liverpool so close? I was. I think before the game, many of us fancied Liverpool to win. Um, but once again, uh, Cardiff performed so well. The grit and determination they showed, they run Liverpool right to the wire. I think overall, Liverpool probably deserved to to win the game. I think maybe they just edged it that second half. I think Downing came into the game. Bellamy made an impact. Um, but once again, it's a cup tie. Anything can happen. Well, I think we'll take this opportunity to bring in Kareem and Abjit. Hi, guys. Did you expect, Kareem, did you expect Cardiff to take Liverpool so far into the game, into penalties? Uh, actually, they were um, before the game. Uh, Jose Mourinho tried to, to, to say uh, he said that uh, they have a big chance of taking Liverpool down, but uh, I think uh, King Kenny had a big uh, big talk with his players, so they can get back the old days, uh, bring them back. So I think uh, King Kenny was the turning point for for Liverpool. And what did you think about the penalties at both sides? Penalties are on both sides, uh, for sure, Liverpool, they have a, 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 a better experience in, uh, in penalties because they, they are exposed more than Cardiff. Abjit, what do you they're, think? They're exposed and they play. Hello, Abjit, what was your thoughts on the game? Well, there's this, you know, all this just goes to prove one thing, right? That in sport, nobody can say anything about anything. Yeah, and you're not, right? yeah, okay. You are an Arsenal uh, fan. What was your thought on the game today? Uh, on the Arsenal game or the Liverpool game? The Arsenal game. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a frustrated Arsenal fan because we always knew that, you know, the team can actually play like this, right? Now, there is no reason why they should be giving us so many, you know, pangs of agony for no good reason. I mean, you saw how 
they chased down balls today they just went after the ball they played with you know grit that's all it, you know it takes you know to play any match and we don't ask for arsenal to win every match we just um, ask that they give their 100% every time Abject. you know Abject. so can i just I mean, come in and just add to that are you frustrated in that reason why they can't do that week in week out and is it frustrating when you know they can perform like that and against the lesser teams maybe they don't yeah i mean it, it's just a question of application and discipline you know i mean the only thing that i do not accept is lack of application and this is the first time actually i think this entire season that i've actually seen them apply their capabilities you know since their champion uh, champions league qualifying matches that is when they beat udinese um, this is the only time you actually got to see what they're capable of doing. I don't think they're up to snuff, if you ask me. But uh, you know, at least uh, you know Arteta was playing well. You know, so at least there was some movement around the midfield. So um, yes, absolutely, I'm happy. Really, um, we watched the game together. What were your thoughts on the game, and do you think this is a turning point for Arsenal, especially in the race for the uh, for who's going to be top dogs in North London? Well, I think we've said it a few occasions this season with Arsenal. They got off to a poor start. They come under some pressure earlier on in the season with the, the transfer dealings they've been doing. They had a spell middle of the season where they came back into form and everyone was raving about them again. They've just come into this game on the back of another poor run of form. But like we've said, JR, it must be so frustrating for Arsenal fans when they see what they can do today, uh, especially as we spoke about earlier, the performance of Walcott was just simply outstanding. Abjit, where do you stand on Arsene Wenger as the manager of Arsenal? See, and that's the trouble. It's like, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, losing your trust in your parents to make the right decision for you, right? I mean, they brought you up and at one point you realize that he's not taking the right decisions. What do you do? You know, so, uh, I mean, you, I think we have to stick with him. Uh, we don't know where this performance came out of. I mean, if it came out of, uh, you know, the speech that uh, Wenger gave them at, uh, uh, at halftime, then, uh, well, then he should have been giving these speeches a long time ago. And if it did not, then maybe he's immaterial. So, um, you know, I don't know where the fault lies. Uh, but I just, you know, I trust Wenger until I'm given to believe otherwise. Well, let's hear from the man himself. I was a bit worried that uh, the team under pressure already would uh, uh, just have a, a problem with the morale, you know, and uh, spirit. And uh, we just refused to lose the game. And really, you spoke about um, Walcott earlier. Tell me a little bit about his performance because many people feel he performs better down the middle. He's played out on the right a lot of the time. How do you think he performed when he went more centrally? Oh, he's outstanding. His pace, his runs in behind. We've seen the desire with his first goal to get forward, to support. But again, I think he needs a run of games through the middle. Obviously, you've got Van Persie on fire at the minute, so that's maybe not possible. But it'd be nice to see him get a run down the middle. Um, We'll see what the future holds for Robin Van Persie at Arsenal. Um, but again, we'd like to see him through the middle. But he's been performing well. Um, definitely think there's a place for him on the right-hand side or through the middle for England. And I think it'll make a big, big impact uh, at the Euros as well. Kareem, what do you think the, uh, the interim manager of England, Stuart Pearce, thought of that Walcott performance? Hello, Kareem? Can you hear me? Reedy, what no. did you think? Kareem, can you hear me? What did you think? I'm sorry. I, uh, okay. Uh, can, you t can you talk again? Can you tell me again? I, I didn't hear you. Yes. What did you think Stuart Pearce would have thought of Walcott's performance today? Reedy, the same question I'm to sorry, you. I can't hear you. The same question to you, Reedy. What he, do you think the, the manager would have thought of the way Walcott performed? He can only have been impressed. Obviously, he's going to have a bit of a dilemma um, with selections, but he can only have been impressed. He is magnificent. And I think people seem to be forgetting how young Walcott still is. Um, there's an expectation that surrounds him, and there seems to be a slight opinion that he's not fulfilled his potential. But having said that, he's still so young. I think that's probably on the back of going to the World Cup so early in 2006. A lot's been expected of him, but he has achieved so much so far, and he's still young. Many people think Harry Redknapp's going to be the next manager of England. Let's see what he thinks. Well, I mean, obviously we went two up, John, but even then I couldn't st stand in and say I felt overcomfortable. I always felt that, you know, they had a few chances and I just felt if they get a goal back, they were, they were playing through us a little bit and, and outnumbering us in the middle of the park and we had problems, really. Really, early on we spoke a little bit about 
if you had to pick an 11 out of the, both the squads, Arsenal and Tottenham, how many Arsenal players would make it? Did today change your mind at all? I know you didn't have too many Arsenal players in your team. <laughs> Not really, to be honest. Uh, on his day, I think Walcott can get, get in any team, as he's shown today. Um, you're probably looking at Robin van Persie, Vermeulen at centre-back maybe. But still, there's, there's not too many others that, that you would put in that Tottenham team. They, in a way, were a bit disappointing today. I, I expected them to, you know, to, to run Arsenal a bit closer than they did. But absolutely superb performance from Arsenal. Abjit, how many players of your Arsenal team do you think would get in a start in 11 between the Arsenal and Tottenham teams? Um... I would say about seven. I mean, there are, there are a few I would exclude uh, no matter how well they played because I just don't trust them. But I would say seven of the you know the people in uh, Arsenal are, are good enough to uh, to start the match um, against Tottenham. That's, that's what your question is, right, if I understood it correctly. Well, I'd like to welcome Steve into the conversation. Hi, Steve. How do you think things are going at your club with the apparent discontent in the dressing room? Um, well, I mean, it's good to know that, um, you know, they're airing uh, their grievances. You know, you can't keep that bottled up. Um, but, you know, having said that, they really need to work through that if they want to uh, contest for the Champions League. Um, I mean, that 3-1 that loss against Napoli, I think it shows how much uh, of a you know, uh, the distent there is between the players and the coach, um, especially after what Lampard had to say, that there is a rift between him and AVB. Um, they really need to work through that. If they do, I think that they can play uh, as a cohesive unit. But until then, they really need to step it up. Well, we'll be discussing what's happening at your club after this. Well, Reedy, we'll take this opportunity to talk a little bit about Chris Samba, who's just secured his move to Anzi. What's your thought on that move for him? Obviously, he's got his move. Um, financially, it's going to be a great move for him. There's no doubt about that. But in football terms, it remains to be seen whether it will be a, a good move for him. Is that something you'd consider in the future, maybe moving on to, to play in further fields for a big pay packet? Uh, for me, the best league in the world is the Premier League. That's a... You know, it's widely known as the best league in the world. I'm enjoying my football and as long as I'm fit enough, I'd like to stay in the Premier League as long as I can. Do you think he'll be trying to make his way back after that move? Is there a way for him to get back to the kind of club he would have liked to have gone to from Blackburn initially? Well, I think he needs to be a little bit careful. It's obviously the prime of his career now in the, his late 20s. It's going to be maybe a little bit difficult you know, if he stays out there for the next three or four years, to well, then come back. Yeah, we've both played with him, and I think, you know, everyone has to wish him all the best of luck, and I know I certainly will. Without a doubt. Great luck to him. Abjit, one of the uh, criticisms of Arsenal squad is that you don't have enough senior professionals, as opposed to Chelsea. What's your views on the uh, senior professionals at your football club? I agree. I agree. And, and the, the, the trouble is not, not so much with uh, seniority as much with character. I mean, if you, if for example, you put uh, Fabregas back in there, you know, he would pretty much be able to pull the strings. It, I don't think it has that much to do with the seniority as much it has to do with character. I mean, personally, I've been, um, I've been thinking that what Arsenal needs is someone like uh, Frank Ribéry or something. You know, somebody who can actually hold the team together with strength and with skill, um, you know, would be a really great acquisition. I don't think it's with seniority. I think it has to do with character, absolutely. Reedy, you've been involved in many dressing rooms. Is it the case that it's the players proving to the manager or vice versa? I think there's a bit of both. Um, I think every great team and every great dressing room, you need your senior players. And I think every, every manager needs a good set of senior players around him. They're, in a way, his eyes and ears in the dressing room. Um, they can go to the manager with problems that are happening in the dressing room. But obviously, in the, the case at Chelsea, there seems to be, you know, something not quite right there in that in that relationship between the manager and the senior players. Steve, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, to be honest, I don't think uh, the players really have much else to prove. I mean, uh, you know, MVB has kept Lampard out, 
And then when he puts it back in, he scores goals uh, and he wins the games. Um, you know, you look at the uh, Champions League game against Napoli, he left out Lampard, Mikel, and Cole. You put those three players in, it's a totally different game. Well, Steve, you know, you've got to accept that the older players can't go on forever. How would you evolve the side? Well, of course. I mean, you know, Lampard said, his, he, even he said it himself, he's 33, you know, how much longer can he do that? But I think that you need to show the uh, senior players that they're still welcome and still balance it out with the younger players. Um, how AVB does that, I don't know. It hasn't worked well so far. Um, I mean, obviously what he's doing isn't working too well, but I think the fans still have the players back, and I think they still have AVB's back for the time being. But really, it's about quality as well, isn't it? You look at the players who have come in, Louise, Cahill, Torres, Mata, are they good enough to replace the players going out the likes of Jogba, Terry and Lampard? I think there's still question marks there. Um, obviously, Kale's come in, so we need to give him a bit of time to see how he does. Luis has definite question marks over his defensive abilities and capabilities. But, you know, yesterday was a big game for, for Chelsea. If they'd lost that, who knows what might have happened? And who does the manager turn to? He turns to the senior players, your Essians, your Lampards, Drogba through the middle. They're the players that you need in the dressing room when you're having a little bit of a a dodgy period in the season. You need to look around that dressing room and see winners and leaders and experienced players, you know, that you want in the trenches with you to get you out of that trouble. Well, we've been joined by Nazir over in Doha, who is a Blackburn fan. Um, how did you see the game yesterday? Uh, the Blackburn game, you mean? Yes, that's right. Uh, well, uh, at the moment, it's grim times at Ewood Park at the moment. It's absolutely ridiculous how Venkis are not running the show. Uh, they've not got a sense of responsibility. The manager shouldn't be in the job. And I think, as far as I'm personally concerned, I think we're relegated. We've done. Uh, I, I predicted 6 0, so I think we've done quite well based on my prediction. Reid, really, it's obviously a club we both know very well. How have you seen things at Blackburn? How can they, how can they get out of this situation they're in at the moment? It's hard to believe the position they're in. When I left the club and since, there's a few senior players that have left exactly what we've just spoken about. In times like this, when you are bottom of the league, you do need your senior players to be in that dressing room and pulling the young lads about and getting them into positions and talking them through it. But you're looking around that dressing room at the minute and there's not too many. Obviously, Ryan Nelson's left recently. Chrissy Samba's just gone. Yourself, Jace. And, you know, the squad looks a little bit thin at the minute. Some people say me leaving is a positive, but on to Nazir. <laughs> um, Chris Samba has left and, and gone to Russia. What's your thoughts about the recruitment and who's gone in and who's left in this, in this window? Uh, well, basically, we've not really done much. Uh, the club's been dismantled. Uh, we're getting cheap players. A couple of weeks ago, I flew into England and on the train from Manchester Airport to Blackburn, uh, I met a couple from Sydney. There was a middle-aged gentleman and a young 16-year-old lad with him. They'd come from Sydney on trial at Blackburn Rovers. And I, and I told the the chap. I said, well, why have you come all that way from the other side of the world to Blackburn? He said, well, because they'll give us an opportunity. That's the positive that's coming out of it, because Blackburn are giving young lads, who they're not paying much, a chance to actually perform. They're not investing. And to survive in the Premiership, it's the toughest league in the world. You've got to invest. Nazir, just three um, answers here. Who do you think is going down this season? Wolves, Wigan and Blackburn. Really? Yep. It's a difficult one. I'm going to have to sit on the fence. I'd like to see Blackburn get out of it for sure. It's going to be difficult for Wigan, but I think it's only three from five at the minute. You know, um, Wolves were, were mentioned there. Um, obviously, they've had to change manager, brought in Terry Connor, who was actually Mick McCarthy's assistant. Reedy, what kind of change can he make considering he was the assistant to the previous manager? It's a surprising decision. Um, from the outside looking in, we've seen the stories of possibly managers turning the job down, uh, given that it was maybe a short-term contract. But they've stuck, they stayed in-house, if you like. Um, he's made changes already. Roger Johnson, captain's been dropped, which is a massive, massive decision. Um, but it seems like the players are behind him. What we've seen yesterday with the interviews from the players, they're fully behind him, fully committed, and you'd expect nothing less from a Wolves team. Well, we can hear from Terry Connor now. To keep doing it, um, add a touch more quality. The end of it, but um, just basically keep doing the same things and 
you know, if you believe in it and you've got confidence in what you're doing, then hopefully things will turn your way. Really, that was after the team talk that he gave to, to help him to come back to 2-2. You played in the game on Mick McCarthy's last game, that, that result for you at West Brom at Molyneux. What did you think about the way that game went and did it look like the players were still fighting for Mick McCarthy? You can never doubt a, a Mick McCarthy team for commitment and, and effort, that's for sure. Um, I've just felt that on the day everything clicked into place for us. It could have actually probably been seven or eight. Hennessy's had a great day. Um, but yeah, mixed emotions from, for myself. Uh, former Ireland manager Mick McCarthy owe him a lot for my debut and bring me to the World Cup. So it was a sad day to, to see him go. But, you know, it was a bit of a disastrous afternoon for Wolves. Yeah, I've been at Wolves myself and I know it's a fantastic club. What was your views on the recruitment process, the way they went about getting a new manager in and then ending up with, with, with TC, Terry Connor? It, it, it did seem a little, little bit messy at the time. Obviously, managers have, have come out and said they're interested, they're not interested. There's been rumours of, of the length of contract involved and the, the bonus and on offer or, or whatever it was. Um, like I said before, they, they've stayed in-house with Terry Connor. Um, it looks like the players have got a, a big respect for him. Um, I know in football especially, he's a well-regarded coach and, and, a, and a great fella. So there's no doubt they can get out of it. They've got the quality. With Doyle and Fletcher up top, they can definitely get goals. And that, you know, that's for sure. And when you're down the bottom of the league, you need players that can get goals for you. On a positive note, it's, one, it's another black manager in the game of which there isn't many. Stephen, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Obviously, it didn't go the way it was intended, but the fact that there's another black manager in the league? Yeah, it's, it can only be a positive. Um, I'm, I'm, I myself are going to be doing my badges in the summer, you know, and I hope it's not just about getting the, the black managers and, the, um, and such into, into management and coaching. It's about getting them on the coaching courses first, which is not to be forgotten. We need to get more black players doing the B licenses and the A licenses to then make the step forward into management and into coaching. Steve, what's your thoughts in New York? Oh, I agree with that 100%. Um, you need to have, I think, more of a diversity when it comes with the coaching. Um, you know, here uh, in the States, that uh, there's a rule in American football that when looking for a coach, you must uh, interview uh, a, a, a black or a, a coach of a different race. And I think that that rule uh, only hope, or excuse me, only helps promote diversity. Um, and you know, people. You know, I can argue about racism and football all they want. Um, to fully end that, I think you need to promote uh, more diverse coaching. Well, with over 30 percent of the playing staff um, being ethnic minorities, it's you know, there's there's not a lot of of managers and coaches involved in the game. Nazir, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I read an interesting article the other day in the uh, Asian Image, uh, which is a newspaper based in Blackburn, and. It was talked there that 50 years on from the first Asians and black people arrived in the UK, we're still, we're still talking about equal opportunities. You know, it's too late in the day. Uh, we need to start, you know, seriously putting quarters in place, I think, now, you know, just to get more black managers in and more Asian players in. We used to run a, an Asian league in the 1980s in Blackburn, and we used to have our cup finals at Ewood Park and at Deepdale. Uh, and it was segregation, and I think it's time now we need to start, you know, putting things into place. And it's about integration and it's about diversity and, and not just lip service but actually doing something about it. Okay Nazir well um, the conversation continues you can get us on Facebook at forward slash sports world have your say we're on Twitter at BBC Sports Wise. Um, Shivam in Dubai has tweeted us he said players have to prove it to the manager no player is bigger than the club so be sure to uh, join, join the uh, con discussion here on Sports World Have Your Say. Myself and Stephen Reid will be continuing for the second half of the show. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, we're just going to go along to uh, Stephen Reid and talk a little bit about how you got on yesterday with your result against that really good team, Sunderland, who have had a resurgence under, under the manager, Martin O'Neill. Tell us a little bit about the game. Amazing performance all round. Uh, I think you'll agree. When you're a team like ourselves, when you're, a, say, a Blackburn, you need 
five, six, seven of your, your big players performing on the day. That's exactly what we've had for the last two games. We've scored nine goals in a season where we've been finding it quite difficult to get the goals, but two magnificent performances back to back. And yesterday, in a, in a resurgent Sunderland side, obviously with the magic of Martin O'Neill, we've performed superbly back to front, kept a clean sheet and a really good day at the office. Well, that's 32 points for your team at the moment. Uh, what has Roy Hodgson been doing to, to get you guys so well drilled? Because you know, when people talk about 40 points to stay up, you guys are nearly there. I said it um, in an interview I'd done a few days ago. Uh, I think they're, as you know about West Brom, they've got the tag of being a yo-yo club, um, getting promotion and getting relegated. I think when he first came in, there was a, a bit of a feeling of uh, inevitability that we'd be going down. I think that whole mindset has changed now. Now we believe we deserve to be in the Premier League, uh, deserve to be not only just in the Premier League, but competing. Um, we're more organised and I think he's just brought that experience to the, to the dressing room that we badly needed when he came in a year ago. And, you know, as, as an ex-teammate, it's good to see you fit and I can see on the pictures there one of those fantastic tackles you still do now. I'm talking about fitness, Ryan Giggs, you know, he came on the night, well, he was on, he scored the winner in the 90th minute again in his 900th game. Just what does it take to play for so long? At that level. That's, that's just incredible. Um, obviously, he's been lucky with injuries. Um, he's steered pretty much clear of injuries through, throughout his career. Um, but to play 900 games is just amazing. Uh, it's a testament to his professionalism and what he does, not just on the pitch, but off it. He obviously looks after his body. I think it's well known that he gets involved in a bit of yoga here and there. And that's obviously helping him. And I think he's just signed another year, which will take him up to you know, up to maybe 940, 950 appearances, which is just incredible. Well, before we discuss this with some Man United fans, let's hear from the man himself. Yeah, it couldn't have gone any better for me personally. Um, you know, obviously, 900 games and, and to score the winner. It's a, it's a great day for me and obviously, um, even more so, a great, great, game, great day for the team. Kareem, um, Man United on a, on a website, Ryan Giggs was put down as the greatest ever player to play for Man United. Would you agree? Yes, I totally agree. The, the guy is amazing. Uh, he has an amazing talent, and he's like, uh, as you guys said, he, he's he's a bit he's a bit he's very lucky with the injuries, and uh, I think he can give uh, two, three, two, two years more. He can give uh, with his uh, lovely talent and experience. I think the United need needs someone like this uh, because all of them are youngsters, and they need someone to look up to. Well, that's Kareem in Cairo. Let's move over to Malik in Mumbai. What's your thoughts on this? Very easily looking, considering he's all salt and pepper right now, but still looking at his fitness, the quality that the man has, he is brilliant. He is unbelievable. Scoring a winner on your 900 game, when you're having a 500 start, when you've been tearing apart the EPL since 1991, it's mesmerizing to watch him play he has scored he has assisted so much this season he has provided so much so many winners have come through his foot it's unbelievable it's without a doubt the biggest legend the club has had till date i would love to see him go for another couple of years knowing that he signed already an extension i would really want him to play till that i maybe he turns 40 41. Jumalee, what's it like as a man united fan to be watching gigs and a, a resurgent certain paul skulls in there uh, playing midfield for you at the moment. must be amazing. Oh, today it was like a league of extraordinary gentlemen. <laughs> two brilliant, two super legends scoring for us amongst a lot of young lads playing alongside them. And like Tom Cleverley used to claim, you know, it's an honour for him to play alongside schools, to just watch him train. And that's the kind of impact these guys can have on the team. It's just they can lift your spirit. And so if you, when you... I was just going to say, if, your, sorry, Mali, if you could pick one more player out of that generation to, to go back into that side? Who would it be? Maybe a Roy Keane in there? Uh, maybe Roy Keane. I would love to see David Beckham back. Either of them. It's, it's just mesmerizing to watch them play. I would really love to watch David Beckham return to the club and just send those deadly crosses in from the right wing and take those, take those kind of free kicks that he always does. Really, we were talking a little bit about what it takes to play so many games. I don't, I'm not sure if me and you have 900 games between us and talking about how you can get to that age and still be playing. Um, what do you think he must be doing to be able to play at that level at that age? I think what we've got to remember, uh, Jay, is that 
the teams he's been playing in as well. He's been playing in some magnificent teams throughout the years. Maybe if he had dropped down a level or to a lesser team, maybe he might not have been able to carry on so long. Don't get me wrong, if he wasn't doing the, doing the business at United, um, I'm sure Sir Alex Ferguson wouldn't have him in his team and in his squad. So he's, he's still performing um, unbelievably. So that's the main thing. Um, what he's doing on the pitch is great, but he must be really looking after himself off the pitch and his nutrition and, and his yoga that he's doing to, to, to keep performing at the top level week in, week out at that age. Reedy, you've had quite a few injuries. Is, is, I mean, does luck play a part in it? Because injuries mean so much to your form and, and trying to get back to your previous form when you're injured. How much does luck have, a, have something to do with, with performing well, at that age for that long? Well, that's right. It, it feels like I have played 900 games, Jase, to be honest, uh, the way my body feels. But, no, jokes apart, it's, it sums, some of it's down to luck. Um, in my case, it's pretty much bad luck. I went in for a couple of tackles and that can be the difference between rupturing a cruciate ligament or not. Uh, it's that split second, you might fall awkwardly, but a lot of it to, is to do with how you look after yourself off the pitch. Um, you need to lead the, the right lifestyle uh, in this day and age in the Premier League. And those senior players that we're seeing, your Scholeses and your Giggses and your Jason Roberts must be doing that to be playing at their age. Good point, Reid, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, Malik in Mumbai, can we have your favourite Giggsy moment? My favourite Giggsy moment Till date is, according to me, the one that took place in the Champions League final against Bayern Munich. I mean, had he not done what he did in that game, maybe we didn't have the treble, maybe a lot of things would not have happened to the club. But the winner that he scored today was truly special. It was really, really special. I mean, to do it at such a, such a stage, do it at such a time when you're chasing the title and knowing the fact that even one simple slip-up can make you lose the title this season, he just stood up at the very right moment to come and score. And it was really mesmerizing to watch him play all 92, 90 minutes. And uh, I really don't know what is it about this man, but he is such a brilliant, he is such a great player. Well, from Mumbai to Doha, Nazir, what's your favourite Giggsy moment? Uh, I think I've got to agree. It's got to be when they won the Champions League. Uh, Giggsy is just phenomenal. The only thing is, when you talk about legends, he is a legend. But when you say he's the old-time legend, I don't know. I think Manchester United have had quite a few. I mean, going back in the olden days, you've got your Bobby Charlton's, George Best, Eric Cantona, your David Beckham's. He's amongst the, amongst the best, but I'm not sure whether he is the, the one. Right, over to Kareem in Cairo. Kareem, a little bit like Chelsea, you are going to have to evolve this, this um, senior bunch of players that have been together for what seems an age. How, how will you do that? In what way will you see that happening? Uh, I think uh, it's going to be, uh, it's really tough to, uh, to, to, to do. I think it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to, uh, to be doing uh, all these years. Uh, Giggs has been uh, taking uh, care of himself uh, and they've been uh, scoring and assisting a lot of goals. And Kareem, you also have and to... I think, uh, sorry, at one point you're going to have to change the manager as well. Who do you see coming in and replacing the legend Sir Alex Ferguson? I, uh, I don't want to see Alex Ferguson leaving, but I have to be a realist and uh, say uh, that uh, I, I want Mourinho to be uh, his successor. Um, uh, actually, I don't want to, uh, anyone, uh, none of United fans do, would like to think uh, for a second about, about Alex Ferguson leaving because he's a, he's a living legend. But, uh, but I think the successor for Alex Ferguson might be uh, Jose Mourinho. He's, he's dying to, go by, to come back to the English Premier League. So I think uh, it might be a great chance for him. And uh, he, he would have an amazing team by two, three years from now. When Alex Ferguson retires, he will be having a nice team, a good team that Alex is uh, built, building right now. Well, we're moving on from the conversation about gigs now to Liverpool. And we've got a call in from Florida. It's Roy. He's a Liverpool fan. What did you think of today's game? Uh, it certainly wasn't any classic, but uh, the, the right result in the end. Um, what would you have done differently? And were you surprised that Cardiff took Liverpool so far right the way through to penalties, Roy? Yeah, I think everyone was surprised. I mean, we, we had a bad start to the day because well, the, the game over here was 11 o'clock in the morning. And um, at quarter to 11, they, they closed the bar and the, the, the police made everyone move out. So it was like a scene from the, the Blues Brothers. Everyone had to go home. 
I watched the game, so it was chaos. So it wasn't a good start. I missed about the first 10 minutes of the game. Um, but overall, I mean, we did dominate and we, we had the most chances. But as always, uh, the way Liverpool have been playing this year, we just, we're not putting the, uh, the ball in the net. So it's been difficult. But um, yeah, no, all credit to Cardiff. They, they kept going. Uh, I wasn't actually surprised when they, they got that equaliser a couple of minutes ago because we just sat back too much. Well, obviously, despite the result today, great to win a bit of silverware. Are you a little bit disappointed in the league form this season, given the amount of money that's been spent? Well, when you look at the, the our away form, it's been terrific. It's just the home form, the amount of draws, and uh, we do need another goal scorer. I mean, I think we've drawn eight games at Anfield, and when you consider that 16 points dropped, well, even if we'd had five of those, that would be another 10 points, we'd be well in the mix. So, I don't think we particularly played badly. Um, we just need to turn those draws into wins. And would you would you say that over the years it's been a case of Liverpool struggling maybe against the the lesser teams, even the teams that that got promoted, like Blackpool last last season that did the double over you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, go, even going back to uh, when Gerard Houllier was in charge, we we always struggled against the smaller teams. We we can always beat the United, we can beat Arsenal, we can beat Chelsea. Um, but when we were playing somebody at home, Stoke City, whatever, we, we seem to we seem to struggle. Which uh, is strange. Whether the the lesser teams, you want to say that, have, have sussed us out a little bit because we are a sort of counter-attacking team that um, that they just sit back and wait for us. And uh, we, we do need that little bit of flair in midfield. You know, another maybe you know someone like Peter Beardsley used to play for as one of them who can open up defences. We, we've just not got that player at the moment. I yes. can see a picture of you on, on, on the screen there, Roy. Um, what's that you're holding? <laughs> hey, hey. Yeah, I, well, I know you wouldn't know what it is, but it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, uh, the Champions League final, I went to Istanbul, so about uh, two weeks after Istanbul, I flew back from uh, Florida against Liverpool to, to lift the trophy, and that's from the museum, so that, that was a great night in Istanbul, one never to be forgotten. Fantastic. Thanks for calling in, Roy. Well, we're going to be speaking about Carlos Tevez and his sorry, the hardest word. Join the conversation after this break with Sports World. Have your say. Well, we've got some other callers in here. We've got Steve and we've got Sebastian from Buenos Aires, I should say. Um, Reedy. Carlos Tevez, him coming back into the dressing room, does that undermine the manager in any way? I don't think so. Obviously, he's issued the, the apology to his, to his manager, to the club. Um, I think there's a bit of a case here of the club being stuck with him, to be honest. I don't think it's any secret that they were, they were trying to sell him in the transfer window that we've just seen. Um, obviously, he didn't get the price that they needed to, you know, to move him on. So it's a bit of a case he's stuck with them to the end of the season. It's going to be a case of... If they go on and win the league, it's a great decision. If they don't, then this might be the point that, you know, they said that that's where it went wrong. We, we, we will see. Sebastian in Argentina, how is this whole saga viewed in Argentina and, and how have you seen it? Hey, hello, how are you? Um, in Argentina, I, I, I think I have a different opinion than the majority of fans and some media companies as well. I've seen newspapers saying that Tevez was on holiday, he was on vacations, and we, we all knew he wasn't. He was just uh, a wall, and, and, and he was just here enjoying his time. And some, some uh, companies in the media uh, reported it as if he was on holidays. Like, it was OK for him to be going to concerts and playing golf, and, and it wasn't the case. It, that wasn't what, what was really happening. And I heard what Steven said. Uh, just now, and, and I think it's a bit of both uh, sides of the argument because I think uh, Tevez might feel that he's uh, stuck at Manchester City because he said that he wanted out, he said that he wasn't happy anymore, and he tried everything to, to secure a move away from, from Manchester City. And then in the end, it didn't happen. I think he did everything in his power to, to, to secure a move elsewhere, and then none of, the, none of these clubs that were interested uh, wanted to pay uh, as much as Manchester, as Manchester City were, were, were asking for him. So I think it's a bit of uh, both sides of the of the coins in, in this situation. And 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 then in the end, one of the one of the one of the 
one of them, uh, Mancini or Tevez, one of them had to, to show the, the white flag and it ended up being Tevez, uh, which I thought it was never going to happen, you know. Sebastian, what's the, what's the thoughts in Argentina about Tevez, you know, as, a, as an individual? Is, has he got the right attitude and, and commitment at Manchester City and when he plays for his country, is there any difference in his attitude then? Well, he's, he, the, the important thing we all have to understand here is that he is regarded as the most popular player for the majority of fans. That, that is slightly changing and, the, and, and it's, going, uh, it's changing a little bit and, and the throne is, is, is more uh, for, of, uh, for Messi to, climb, uh, to, to claim right now. He is uh, slowly uh, starting to become the, the real king of Argentine football, but before and not so far, not so long ago, he was Tevez. Make no mistake, he 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 was more uh, more popular than Messi because he made it big in Argentina. He made it big with one of the best teams in Argentina, uh, Boca Juniors, the most popular team in Argentina. So uh, little kids grow up uh, grew up watching Tevez play every every weekend here in Argentina, and so he was bigger than Messi in that regard. And um, if Messi was not uh, included in the national team in the past, it wasn't such an outrage, uh, and that w what it would it would have been if Tevez was excluded. Like he was the darling of the of, of the people here in Argentina, and it's because of his uh, rags to riches uh, story. You know, he's he's, uh, he's a he's a guy that really had it rough in his childhood. I know the place where he where he was born, and it's believe me, it's not it's not easy to get out of there alive let alone become a, a legend in, in football. Then he conquered Brazil, playing for Corinthians. He won the, the league there. He was an idol in Brazil, and that is really difficult if you're an Argentine because of the rivalry between these two countries. And then he did, he did the same in England, and he managed to, to, to become a, a cult hero in three different clubs. And then he let it all slip through his, through his fingers. So it's, I see it with a little, uh, with a little bit of... Um, uh, pity, and, and and I think it's a shame that he he tarnished his image, that he alone uh, managed to 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 secure in the past. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sebastian, you mentioned three clubs there. I'm going to just bring in Kareem from Cairo, who's a Man United fan. Obviously, Tevez loved that West Ham. How's this whole thing viewed at Man United, the red half of the city? Uh, actually, uh, Carlos Tevez is not the role model to look up for uh, between the players. I think uh, in the dressing room he might make uh, some problems because uh, he went uh, in a very crucial time for Manchester City and they are uh, uh, competing uh, very tightly with Manchester United. So he, he, he had a problem at that time. Uh, I think it's the manager's choice. It's, um, to put him back on the pitch, and I think if he's uh, he's back on the pitch, I think it's going to be something really positive for Man Manchester City, because uh, the guy is a, a great footballer and he has a very good talent. Other than uh, his uh, bad reputation and uh, the the um, uh, people think of him, he's a troublemaker. But at, at the end, it's the coach's choice to to put him back on the field, and if he's back, uh, he's a big threat. Kareem, do you feel that? Sir Alex Ferguson maybe saw something in Carlos Tevez that he didn't like, which was the reason why he didn't want to spend the 25 to, to 30 million to sign him full time. Uh, definitely, definitely. Alex Ferguson has a, a really good eye when he when he sees someone which uh, he's not that uh, kind of personality he needs in the team, and he thinks that he's gonna make. Uh, uh, trouble between the t uh, his mates, so uh, he might uh, make him leave the team. That's why he didn't sign him per permanently. Well, I'd just like to bring in Sam from Limerick, who's a Man City fan. Sam, what's your view on the whole affair? Well, I think any club would, any team would be improved by by the addition of Carlos Tevez. Um, I take the point that off the pitch he can be a bit of a disruptive influence, but um, I'd also be quick to point out that. Alex Ferguson did offer 25 million for the guy, so maybe his judgment isn't quite as perfect as United fans would like to believe it is. Um, Sam, you've got obviously other strikers who've been a good job, Aguero, Balotelli, Zeko. How do you think they're going to feel about Carlos Tevez coming back into the squad and potentially competing for a place with them? 
Well, let's face it, um, competition is always a good thing in any squad. And you've got to accept that if you're at the top of the game, that there's going to be top players coming in. And I think let's be, we have to be honest with ourselves that most of these guys, they're in it for themselves and for their own glory as much as for the club. And if they, if Carlos Tevez can help them win a league, they'll take it with both hands and be delighted for City second after themselves. Sam, have you missed him? Have you missed him playing for you over the last few months? As a player, perhaps uh, there were one or two games, maybe Sunderland and West Brom, where you would, you would have loved to have had him on. But having said that, um, you know, it was times I felt like slapping him as well. <laughs> well, Sam, um, you're Republic of Ireland. You lost a, recently lost a player, um, Stephen Reid as well. Have you missed him? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and <laughs> Stephen Ireland, I think, maybe, <laughs> in a similar fashion from the Ireland team to Tevez. Uh, went out, and that seems to, it's such a, such a waste of talent, you know. Really, just just a question: um, How would you welcome someone in this situation back into a dressing room that you were part of? It's a difficult one. I think it all depends what position you're playing. If if it's a striker and you're a striker, you know it might get your back up a little bit. If it's not your position, then then maybe not so. Um, let's you know let's not forget he's a great player. They've got 12 games to go now. I'm sure he's going to help their cause in the running, but he's not played for a few months now and it's going to take a good few games to get back up to match speed. So it's going to be interesting to see how he gets on and, and what sort of part he plays in the, in the running. Steve in New York, you're a Chelsea fan. What do you make of it? Um, I mean, it's definitely, you know, it's nice to see that Chelsea isn't the only team that's having a dispute with players. Um, the only difference is Tevez actually left. And I think in that situation, you just need to bite the bullet, suck it up, and go out there and play whether you want to or not. You know, you sign a contract for your team and you need to honor that. But, I mean, it's nice to see that he's doing the right thing and that he's coming back. Sam, just going to you, Sam. Now, could it be an unwanted distraction, this Tevez coming back in? Because already the, the papers this week have been trying to get older pictures with with Tevez and the manager in, rather than obviously fighting for the league title, that's the story. The story seems to be now, obviously, Tevez Mancini, and that's what it all seems to be about. Yeah, but I mean, the story is the story, and the press will, will always look for some kind of an angle. And Sam, you, you Sam I'm just going to have to come in there as we're running out of time. We really enjoyed the show, myself and, and Reedy. It's been fantastic joining you on Sports World. Have your say. Hope.